What does Xi Jinping have in mind for Taiwan? I speak with senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, Michael Schumann, about Xi's recent remarks at the 20th Party Congress, as well as cross-strait tensions. Americans in D.C. tell us if they're worried about China attacking Taiwan and if they think the U.S. should send troops to defend Taiwan. We'll also tell you about some extreme weather in Taiwan and a global barista champion. This is Taiwan Insider. Welcome to the show. The whole world has been watching China's 20th Party Congress, and we here in Taiwan are concerned about Xi Jinping's intentions for Taiwan. Now, today I speak with Michael Schumann, who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. He is based in Beijing, and he is also the author of Superpower Interrupted, The Chinese History of the World. I asked him what he thought of Xi's speech and remarks on Taiwan. What's interesting there, uh, again, was that he actually didn't say uh, really anything new on the Taiwan issue. Uh, you know, on the positive side, it means he didn't he didn't escalate anything, and you know, he didn't make any new demands. He didn't say anything differently about what his his attitude is towards the status quo or anything. But it's clear that the Taiwan issue has risen as an important under Xi Jinping. It's a, a a topic he talks about all the time, and it's it's become a, a very important part of, you know, his his view of, you know, what he calls the Chinese dream, this dream of a return to China's past greatness, and Taiwan has become an indispensable part of that. I wouldn't anticipate going forward that again you're going to see a continuation of his stance towards Taiwan in the last couple of years, which is you know an intensification of pressure. Uh, diplomatic and, and military on Taiwan in, 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 the, in the, the hopes of preventing the Taiwan government from, you know, drifting closer to the United States, which uh, Xi Jinping, I think, finds very, very threatening. Well, he did say, um, you know, that he was warning against interference by outside forces. So it seems like that message was for the United States and also for other countries that are, you know, concerned about defending Taiwan. What do you think about his message to the United States? I, I I think the view in Beijing now for some time has been that Washington is is kind of salami slicing its one China policy and is kind of working to undermine uh, the idea of one China through its continued exchanges with Taiwan. That's going to continue to be of great concern in Beijing. There are some voices in the U.S. who say, well, in Washington, took a more cautious policy and and made a more made it clearer that Washington really does intend to uh, to stick to its one China policy and maintain the status quo. That uh, this would then kind of lead to an easing of tensions. But there's also a dynamic here between Beijing and Taipei, which I think often gets kind of left out of the equation. And uh, I think Xi Jinping finds the current uh, government in Taipei to be in, especially threatening and what uh, President Tsai is doing in, in terms of trying to gain a greater greater stature for Taiwan on the world stage and greater support from around the world. It, it, I think Xi Jinping feels threatened by the whole direction that Taiwan society is going where there seems to be less and less and less interest in, in unification and, and uh, a partnership with China. So I, I, there's a lot of dynamics going on here that are unfortunately leading in negative uh, uh, directions where you know, you're likely going to see higher tensions. Do you think that Xi Jinping has a timeline for reunification or for the possible use of you know all necessary measures, uh, military force, basically? It's, it's a great question. It's one that everybody's asking, and it's one, unfortunately, I, I don't think we have a really good answer. There are people who make the equation between Xi Jinping's rise and continued control of China and the, the greater likelihood of conflict. However, I think what we've also seen in recent months is there's only really so far as Xi Jinping really wants to go on Taiwan. Again, he didn't escalate anything in his speech, which was a very important speech and platform for him. He very easily could have done so. He chose not to. Uh, and even even elements you know, uh, surrounding the 
uh, visit of uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan in August that sparked this very uh, aggressive reaction from from China with those extensive military operations. And, and he crossed the red lines there, but he also didn't cross others. He didn't, for instance, send Chinese jets actually over the island. Steps that actually could really have led to an accidental conflict. There's uh, a ceiling, uh, you know, through which he's not willing to go with at this point. And I think that's an indication that that he is not ready for war, actual war, and the risk of war, you know, at at, at this stage. So it's 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 unclear as to I think where this is this is really headed and what the time frame may be. Unfortunately, as long as tensions stay high, like they are, you know, the the, the chances of a conflict increase, uh, whatever whatever anyone's intentions actually are. We also saw on TV some signs of protests, like banners and, and some minor protests uh, against Xi Jinping. What would you say about public sentiment uh, towards his leadership at this time? I think there's very obvious frustration in the major cities, well, such as here in Beijing, with aspects of Xi Jinping's policies, especially his, his continued very uh, strict controls aimed at preventing a, a major COVID outbreak, but also some uh, policies on, on the economy. So that's become quite quite obvious and quite visible, both on, both on the streets and also online. In other parts of the country, uh, where it hasn't been as severely affected by, for example, his zero COVID uh, policies, the attitude towards some of these some of these regulations and policies may not be quite as as negative. And also, you know, Xi Jinping generally, you know, his his messaging about or re, uh, about uh, you know China's return to to greatness uh, and um, overcoming its challenges on the world stage and becoming a great power again, and uh, you know, unification with Taiwan. These these are all very, you know, popular ideas with a certain part of the Chinese population. So it's very likely that Xi Jinping also has a fair level of, of support among the Chinese public as well. Now, the whole interview will be up on social media. And if you like our content, do follow and subscribe. Now, we're not the only ones who are concerned about an attack on Taiwan. We asked our partners at Voice of America to talk to Americans to see if they're concerned about China attacking Taiwan and if they think U.S. troops should be sent here to help defend Taiwan. Well, I am concerned permanently about current issues and global crisis escalating. I am not concerned specifically about China attacking Taiwan because I understand that um, China is concerned about the risk that this implies for the global economy and especially for its economic trade relations in Asia. I am, yes. I think that as a result of the war in Ukraine, the chance for China to attack Taiwan and potentially escape international reaction, at least effective international reaction, is at an all-time high. Right now, through the sanctions imposed against Russia, I think that a lot of political will, a lot of economic will, has been expended in Europe. If China was to attack Taiwan, committing to sanctions against the, by comparison, far larger Chinese economy compared to Russia would require a lot of political will and staying power that I think right now the West doesn't have. From my perspective, I actually think Taiwan is like a part of China. Yeah, no, like uh, I don't actually know about it as an independent country. If the U.S. allows China to attack and take Taiwan, that could very well escalate into a wider regional conflict so that the U.S. would find its soldiers facing Chinese soldiers sooner or later somewhere in the Eastern Pacific. The best way to prevent that, to ensure that doesn't happen, is to have a sizable U.S. military presence in Taiwan before China commits to any action. I think more diplomacy would be better, okay? More like, we're going to do this, we're really not going to do this, but we're going to do this type of thing. That's what I think would probably be better, okay? Because in all honesty, I don't think Taiwan could 
do what Ukraine did, in my opinion. I think what happened there is why the Americans may not be ready for another battle because they're still smarting from Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. You know, it's like um, there's not enough, I think, with Taiwan to say, oh yeah, let's go. So I do believe that the United States should defend Taiwan with troops and any other economic or military support because not doing so would mean putting the U.S. economic relations at risk um, and like I mentioned before, it would be putting the global economy at risk as well. Especially now that Taiwan is heavily involved with the production of chips. Next up, our newest co-host, Itamar Waxman, tells you how extreme weather has been affecting Taiwan this week. Taiwan was hit hard earlier this week by Typhoon Nessat. Some areas in central Taiwan saw significant damage. Typhoon Nessat and seasonal northwestern winds have caused some extreme weather around Taiwan. In central Taiwan's Miaoli City, an interior wall in the main train station collapsed as a result of strong winds. Local commuters had to take care as they went to work. Station head Wu Zhaodi says the station has already implemented emergency measures. He says the wind damage has made the usual entrance unusable. Now riders will enter and exit from a temporary door on the first floor. The severe weather has even affected RTI. A radio tower at RTI station in central Taiwan's Zhanghua County was bent and broken by the powerful gusts. One Zhanghua resident says the winds were so dangerous that local workers riding scooters were forced to stop. Even trees throughout Taiwan were knocked down by the winds. In Taichung, one large tree was knocked down, damaging cars and forcing emergency services to quickly clear the road. One local resident says when a previous typhoon brought down trees, he asked local authorities if the trees in the area could all be cut to prevent future damages. He says he was ignored. Weather service official Ke Junxian says while Nessa is moving away from Taiwan, the northeastern winds might influence the island. Authorities remind the public to be careful when going out in coastal areas due to wind advisories. Coffee is getting more and more popular in Taiwan. Now, a Taiwanese has won first prize at a renowned coffee brewing competition. The aroma of coffee fills the audience's nostrils as Xu Siyuan walks them through the process in English. We have complex flavor, just like a cup of fresh juice that you want to finish in a cup. Xu is soft-spoken and constantly smiling, so some might be surprised to learn that she is this year's reigning champion of the WCE Coffee Brewers' Cup. She says some people think her key to success is her relaxing and positive attitude when describing the process to the jurors. Xu decided to become a barista after three years of military service, but her natural talent makes up for the relatively late start. Xu came in fifth at the 2019 Coffee Brewers' Cup, represented Taiwan again in 2020, and after a break due to the pandemic, she brought home the championship in 2022. She says the fight was tough and she's surprised to have won. Xu is not the only prominent barista from Taiwan, and the country itself is drinking more and more of the black nectar of the gods. Coffee imports increased by 5% between 2017 and 2020. The average Taiwanese person drinks 124 cups of coffee per year for a total of over 2.8 billion. Wu Ling from the Taiwan Coffee Association says bean imports have gone up tenfold in recent years. This much coffee and great baristas may not matter to everyone, but for those who share Xu Siyuan's passion, mm, it makes all the difference. The law and cinema might seem like a strange combo, but the fourth annual Judicial Film Festival hopes to creatively raise awareness about the legal system. Some of the most acclaimed movies ever center around tense judicial proceedings. But legal battles are often dramatized and overblown on screen, right? Taiwan's judicial branch doesn't think so. It's trying to start a dialogue between the public and the judiciary through the medium of film. Taiwan's fourth annual Judicial Film Festival will open next month. The film festival is a joint collaboration between Taiwan's judicial authorities and the Golden Horse Film Festival. This year's event will feature six films, two from Taiwan, and one each from Japan, France, Germany, and the United States. Taiwan's judicial head, Xu Zhongli, says film is a great medium to raise awareness about social issues and the judicial system. He says more awareness is a way to get people involved in society and thinking about the legal system. 
The Judicial Film Festival is scheduled to show films in northern, central, and southern Taiwan throughout November. Though it is an unusual collaboration, it might be one that can create real and tangible change. Before we leave the studio, here are some other stories that have been on our radar. Hundreds of visitors to Taiwan's mountainous Ilan County were left stranded following torrential rainfall in northern Taiwan over the weekend. Motorists and passengers stranded in their cars due to landslides and rockfall were taken to safety. Over 300 visitors staying in Mingsu village had to rely on emergency generators for power since Sunday. Most of them were evacuated on Wednesday. Taiwan's economic minister, Wang Meihua, says that new U.S. restrictions on semiconductor and equipment exports to China won't have a big impact on Taiwanese manufacturers. In August, the U.S. introduced the Chips and Science Act, which limits exports of technology, equipment and materials used in advanced chip production to China. Wang says that the Taiwanese chipmaking giant TSMC has obtained a one-year license to continue ordering American equipment for its manufacturing facility in Nanjing. Local elections are less than a month away and campaigns are heating up. After a string of thesis plagiarism accusations in various races around the country, candidates in Taipei are squabbling over credit for developing quarantine hotels. Those were designated hotels where guests could undergo COVID-19 quarantine. Former Health Minister Chen Shizong and former Deputy Mayor Huang Sansan both claimed they were instrumental in developing the system. The owner of Taiwan's first quarantine hotel says it was Huang who got the plan off the ground. Well, I'm really excited to welcome our newest co-host, Itamar Waxman. And um, Itamar, let us know a little bit about yourself. Uh, what brought you to Taiwan? Uh, well, I guess I just wanted to speak Mandarin fluently, and I wanted to start working as a journalist out here and covering some of the stories that I thought were really interesting. That's great. And what is your uh, the beat that you're most interested in? Mostly society and indig indigenous issues. That's great. So, you know, Itamar is actually on the radio right now at RTI, and now he's going to be on video yes. with us on Taiwan Insider. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so, Natalie, I have a question to ask you. Okay. Um, what is the most extreme weather event you've ever experienced? Okay. Well, actually, um, this is, you know, common to people who've been in Taiwan for a while. There was this typhoon called... Typhoon Nari, which flooded mm. Taipei in 2001. And I stayed indoors, but my husband went outside. The first floor was flooded, and he was really worried about a friend of ours who's in a wheelchair and lives on the first floor. So he swam to his home on what? the other side of town. And he actually was already taken to a second floor oh. space. But he actually rescued a really nice violin, which was owned by another friend who was living with him. So he, he was like a hero, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know what he was doing. He was like, I got to go find sh our friend Xiao Tang. And then I heard wow. this story. It was like, wow. It That's was amazing. a little scary because, you know, there's yeah. things floating in the water and everything. How far did he go? It was from um, Liu Zhangli to the Taipei City Hall. That's pretty far. Yeah. yeah. So that's it's a lot of swimming. Yeah. It was crazy. I mean, it was all the way to the first floor. And the underground mall was flooded. It was bad. Yeah. So. Wow. All right. Yeah. Um, well, for mine, I don't know if anyone knows this, but I grew up in Denver, Colorado, where it snows a lot during the winter. And so my most extreme weather event was the 2003 blizzard. In 2003, Ooh. it snowed, I believe, over a foot in one night. So that, for people in Taiwan, that's over 30 centimeters, I believe, of snow. So like you had basically this much snow off the ground. And so, yeah, we had two days off of school <laughs> and must have been uh, happy about that. we were just making like snowmen and um, like there was so much snow, you could build tunnels and, but like you couldn't go to the store for basically three days. They couldn't clear the snow from the road. And it was just too dangerous to drive. So we were just like stuck at home for three days and that was like a crazy blizzard. But I had a lot of fun. I was like a little kid at that for, time. For so. kids, yeah, it's fun. What about people? Do they not go to work as well? Um, basically, yes. I, I guess some people try to go to work for like, if, if you're a doctor, for example. My dad was a doctor, so he still found his way to the hospital. Um, but yeah, most people just stayed indoors because the snow just kept coming and coming and coming. Yeah. 
So that's fascinating. So for Taiwan, it's mostly typhoons that hit us, and I hope everyone was safe this past week. But uh, thank you for tuning in to Taiwan Insider. I am Natalie So. And I'm Imar Waxman. You can follow us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook. Also on YouTube. And do leave a comment, subscribe, follow us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, for Taiwan Insider, I'm Natalie So. We'll see you next week. Bye.